It's the 27th of August 1992, at around 8pm on a quiet country road on the outskirts of Edinburgh. Two ordinary men experienced something extraordinary, which became a profound event in both Scottish and global UFO mythology. This event, known as the A70 case, was the alleged abduction of two men by extraterrestrials. Neither of the two men, Gary Wood and Colin Wright, expected anything out of the ordinary when they set out on that fateful night. Their journey was from the south of Edinburgh on the A70 to the village of Tarbrax in East Lothian, a drive of about 15 miles. The journey, which normally takes around 30 minutes, was in connection with a domestic appliance repair. At around 10pm, they drove through the clear summer's night at about 40 miles an hour, chatting about family and other things in general. Rounding a blind corner in the vicinity of Harper Egg Reservoir, Colin abruptly leaned forward, exclaiming, What the hell is that? Gary peered through the windscreen. There, ahead of the car, floating about 20 feet above the road, was what appeared to be some kind of two-tiered, disc-shaped object. He remembers it being about 30 feet wide, wider than the road itself, prominent against the night sky, the moon peering from behind it. Gary, a motor mechanic by trade, who was familiar with a diverse range of mechanical devices and metal finishes, found the appearance of the object very unusual. Wanting to get away as quickly as possible, Gary floored the accelerator, pushing their vehicle up to almost 70 miles an hour. In Colin's words, Gary was driving like a bloody madman. As they passed below the hovering craft, a shimmering curtain of light descended on the car. Gary describes it as like looking at a detuned TV set, just flickering lights. Instantly, they were enveloped in total, complete darkness. Later under hypnosis, Gary recalled standing outside the car. It was still totally and utterly dark. Not a hint of light. He couldn't even see the car. Just for a moment, he thought they had crashed, and he was dead. He blacked out for what felt like a few seconds. Then abruptly, he was awake, and the car was veering all over the road. Gary could hear Colin shouting at him to watch out. Then eventually, he was able to bring the car to a stop. They looked at each other in disbelief. What had just happened? The cool night air was a relief as they gathered themselves. Setting off again, they arrived at their destination, still discussing their bizarre encounter. Arriving at Tyrex, they pulled over at their friend's house. Gary slipped his hand down to free the seatbelt, but it was already undone. He was briefly puzzled, but thought no more of it. Assuming the time to be around 10.40pm, they unloaded the car. They knocked on the door. Several minutes went by. Then they heard an upstairs window open, and their friend's head emerged from the window. He inquired none too politely just what they were doing, and informed them that it was quarter to one in the morning. Naturally, they thought he was joking, but he wasn't. They had lost two hours. The men had made the journey to Tarbrax several times and knew it normally took about 30 minutes. Entering the house in a state of agitation, the men attempted to describe what they had seen, even sketching the craft they had witnessed hovering above the deserted stretch of road. It was well into the small hours when Gary and Colin left for Gilmerton on the outskirts of Edinburgh. Not surprisingly, they did not return by the same route, and neither man recalls much about the journey. Paranormal investigator Malcolm Robinson originally interviewed the householders a few days after the event. They both agreed that Gary and Colin were both clearly agitated and from past experience knew neither man was prone to either lying or dramatics. The following day, Gary felt utterly drained of energy, more than just a result of his late night. He felt really worn out. The following few days did not help matters. He was not sleeping well, 
he experienced vivid, disturbing dreams, and his sleeping patterns changed for the worse. Eventually consulting his doctor because of severe headaches, he was advised to have an MRI scan, which fortunately proved negative. Fearing ridicule, neither Gary nor Colin reported the incident to the police or media. They did, however, inform Bufora, the British UFO Research Association. As a result of their experience, Gary became engrossed in ufology in an attempt to understand what had happened. As a result, he contacted Strange Phenomena Investigations, or SPI, founded by Malcolm Robinson in 1979, to arrange a meeting. This was arranged, and after two preliminary meetings, Malcolm, SPI's founder, suggested using the controversial technique of hypnotic regression to access what had occurred during this missing time. Although Gary and Colin had some misgivings, an initial session was arranged using Scottish hypnotherapist and psychic Helen Walters. During the first session, Gary became very emotional and burst into tears. There was nothing specific, only vague images and impressions. Later regression sessions were to prove much more revealing. In later sessions, both men remembered sitting in the car, which was stopped in the middle of the road. Small humanoid creatures, three to each side, opened both front doors of the car. Colin recalls Gary being placed on a type of stretcher or carrier of some kind. None of the entities were supporting it. The stretcher was free-floating. Gary, although he remembers none of this, does recall creatures approaching the car and then a searing pain in his abdomen, as if his stomach muscles were being torn apart. For his part, Colin recalls walking up a ramp into the craft, which was lit by a dazzling white light. He remembers being in a circular corridor being led by one of the creatures, although some of his recollections are hazy and seem to jump from scene to scene. The room was utterly featureless, except for an unusual chair. It was curiously curved, almost organic in shape. It was stripped naked and placed unresisting in the chair was subjected to some form of non-intrusive physical examination. He also remembers lying back in the chair, looking at the ceiling. It was corrugated, translucent. There was soft, diffused light filtering through. This memory merged seamlessly into being naked in a transparent container made from a material rather like glass or perspex. Straps at the feet and ankles secured him. Outside the container, he could clearly see other men and women, all naked and all in transparent containers like his. He also saw a number of tall humanoid creatures. One was standing framed in a doorway opposite him, and another three were approaching the container in which he was imprisoned. Abruptly, the transparent material of his container began to frost up. He became alarmed and began to weep. No sooner had he done this than the frosting began to retreat. Colin nervously watched as an angular device rose from the floor. It was long and thin, like a rod with a small triangular head. Two glowing red lights were set into one of the sides. There was a peculiar appendage about halfway along the length of the device, and the base was jointed at the floor. The entire machine moved up and down continuously and the appendage swung from left to right. Although there was no pain, Colin thought it might be scanning him. After Gary's initial session, his recall improved dramatically. Like Colin, he described being in the featureless circular room, lying on a flat table. He was unable to move, although he does not recall being physically strapped down. He was aware of a black lens-shaped device in the centre of the room. The device was twisting and turning, almost as if it were unfolding on itself. It reminded Gary of a Mobius strip. Although he had no idea of its function, he heard it make a whooshing noise, as if air was being displaced. He had had a further impression that the device was tuning or stabilising itself, 
prior to the steady whooshing sound, he had the distinct feeling that the sound emitted by the device was wrong or lopsided, almost as if it was in some way out of balance or synchronization. The even whooshing noise indicated that it was now functioning normally. As he watched the device in fascination, he suddenly became aware of a long, thin, translucent arm extending over his chest towards his head. The arm abruptly dropped onto his chest near to his shoulder. This particular trauma affected Gary quite powerfully, and he jerked out of the hypnotic trance, his body convulsing. On another occasion, he remembers a hole forming in the floor. It was filled with a viscous liquid of some kind, like a gel. While he watched this, a small column rose from the floor. Gary described it as resembling a tin can. It continued to rise until it was around three feet above the floor. The device gave out a noise, rather like an electric motor, and began to rotate slowly. Part of the cylinder rose from the main body and extended towards him until it was level with his eyes. The tip of the extension had two red glowing dots. At this point, Gary noticed the pool of liquid start to vibrate. From the liquid, a tall, incredibly thin, frail-looking creature slowly, almost painfully emerged. Although bearing a marked similarity to the traditional grey, it appeared emaciated, like a skeleton covered in skin. He remembers that the skin over its rib looked discoloured and bruised. He later discovered that all the creatures had difficulty with the gravity and the atmospheric pressure, particularly the tall ones, thin translucent creatures that frequently tended to fall over. It was his impression that due to the bruised appearance of the creatures, the pool of gel was some form of therapeutic agent designed to treat the damage caused by their frequent falls. Bizarrely, he also recalled a small man, apparently quite human dressed in a neat black suit, complete with collar and tie, who was watching the proceedings. He was standing among the entities, all of which seemed quite deferential towards him. In all, Wood remembers there being around 20 or 30 creatures present, the majority tall a pallid grey colour and frail looking. One notable variation from this was a smaller, rather bizarre looking being with an odd heart shaped face. On its face were some strangely familiar markings. These comprised coloured facial stripes, three diagonally on each cheek. These were reminiscent of the tribal markings normally associated with members of the Native American tribes. He looked at the creatures and mentally asked, why are you doing this? The answer that appeared in his mind was surprising and not a little disturbing. One word, sanctuary. sanctuary. While he was in telepathic communication with the creature, he was able to see fragments of his existence. As if the process was a two-way street, the creature found this amusing, but could not prevent it. In a further mental communication, the being said, In, in many, many ways, ways you are more advanced than us, but you have been trapped. Our existence is much like, like your own. own. We, we also have concerns and needs. Just what capped means is open to question. Gary is certain that at one point they were taken underground. From the table where he lay, he could see tunnels leading off from a huge central chamber made of solid rock. There was also an enormous machine close to him. Possibly it was another flying machine, like the one he had witnessed above the road. Perhaps Gary's most worrying memory was seeing a young woman seated naked on the floor, facing the wall. One of the tall creatures was standing beside her. As Gary looked at her, she turned her head towards him. Her hair was in a loose, shaggy perm with blonde highlights. She was sitting shivering with her knees drawn up to her chin. Her arms were wrapped around her knees, cradling herself. She had been crying and was clearly in the same predicament as him. 
he is convinced now that should they meet again, he would recognise her instantly. It should be stressed that Gary is totally sincere in his belief, and his sincerity shows he certainly does not give the impression that he had concocted the whole thing. As part of a later BBC TV programme, Gary agreed to undergo a polygraph or lie detector test supervised by Bud Hopkins, an American UFO abduction guru, and Professor Sarah Greenfield, a lecturer in psychology and presenter of Brain Story, a BBC series dealing with perception. While he was attached to the machine, Professor Greenfield asked Gary a series of leading questions and he passed the test. Although this does not mean that he was actually abducted by aliens, it does indicate that he believes something highly unusual occurred. However, the use of polygraphs is a controversial issue, almost as much as hypnotic regression. It is claimed that the machine can be duped into accepting a response to a question as the truth when it's not. In the A70 case, this is entirely justified, as there is one overall flaw in the evidence presented, the hypnotic regressions. A period of almost six months elapsed between the incident and the regressions. Six months in which both men, because they were not initially familiar with the subject of UFOs and ufology, had time to read all they could about the subject and the mythology surrounding it, particularly Gary. This alone must render the disclosures as presented under regression unreliable. Add to this the predisposition for the typical hypnotic subject to please the questioner by saying what is expected of them, and the evidence begins to fall apart. Without these crucial statements, what is left is that the undeniable conviction of both men that a real event took place, an event that they cannot otherwise explain. Following the alleged abduction and subsequent regressions, Gary and Colin dealt with the ordeal in different ways. Gary became deeply involved in the study of UFOs and the paranormal in general to the extent of setting up his own research group, whereas little or nothing is known about Colin's subsequent reaction to all this. And so this event, this mystery, lives on. Unsolved and unclear, it leaves tantalising thoughts for either the imagination or the earnest investigator. Surely this cannot be one of those crazy UFO stories, can it? She phoned me, she said, Mr. Robinson, can I apologise to you? I said, why? You know, I've always never accepted my husband's testimony on this, too, she has. She says, well, last night, I was lying in bed next to my husband. I, well, I wasn't asleep. I wasn't asleep. And then suddenly, I felt my ankles, something on both ankles, and I was being pulled forcibly down the bed. And I, and I looked up, and for a few fleeting seconds, I saw two grey figures at the foot of the bed saying, now, I 100% believe my husband, 100%. That case for me, because I was dealing with it, the sharp end, the front end of it, convinced me I've never seen two more honest, two more sincere people in all my life. The evidence portrayed to me, which I've just briefly touched upon, was sufficient enough to take me off the proverbial sceptical fence and put me back into the believer's camp.